Chapter 1 Alien Genesis Since the very earliest times of mankind, there has existed a particular mental attitude on the part of man as regards the existence of a thought supposed to be superior to his own. This is the religious attitude. Until now, human thinking has never been applied to a category of thought supposed to be superhuman, other than in a religious context. The particular difficulty of ufological research is, consequently, the difficulty of applying oneself to a superhuman phenomenology merely with the methods of science and excluding all mysticism. M. Michel Professor Torquil Jakobsen, scholar of ancient religions, once wrote that, Basic to all religion is, we believe, a unique experience of confrontation with power, not of this world. Hans Jonas, the authority on Gnosticism, wrote concerning the god of the Gnostics, The alien taken absolutely is the holy transcendent, the beyond, and an eminent attribute of God. The Gnostics saw God as an alien, as a being from elsewhere who sojourned on Earth for a time. That is not to say that either of these two authorities were speaking of alien astronauts. They were not. They were, however, coming to grips with the concept of the divine and how that experience was understood by ancient peoples as both alien and terrifying. In Jakobsen's case, he was writing about ancient Babylon in the 3rd millennium BCE. In the work of Jonas, we are talking about a sect that flourished in the first few centuries of this era. Although they represent cultures separated by thousands of years from each other, the reaction to the divine experience was similar. The alien, the strange, the terrifying. Gnosticism is the word used to describe a loose affiliation of mystical groups that flourished in Egypt and the Middle East in the first few centuries of the Common Era and that survived in some parts of the Middle East to the present day, incorporating some Islamic elements along the way. The word Gnosis means knowledge, and it is used here to describe a movement that arose out of Jewish, Christian, and later Islamic thought that claimed special insight into the mystical or hidden aspects of their respective faiths. In particular, the groups we consider Gnostic today mostly have their origins in early Christianity. Although there was a heavy Jewish component as well, Christianity began, after all, as a Jewish sect. Gnostics felt that the story told in the Torah the first five books of what Christians call the Bible, or the book, is an exoteric version of a deeper esoteric truth, and that the Jews and Christians had misinterpreted or misunderstood the texts. For instance, a key element of much Gnostic thought is the doctrine of the Demiurge. In this retelling of Genesis, the creation of the world is said not to be that of God, but of a subordinate creature known as the Demiurge, a term that comes from Platonism and which refers to the Creator, but considered to be responsible only for the material universe. To the Gnostics, the Demiurge is opposed to spirituality. In the Garden of Eden, according to this idea, the serpent who tempted Eve was the supreme being. The Demiurge was the one who warned Adam and Eve against eating the fruit of the Tree of Knowledge. Famously, the serpent advised Eve that if she and Adam ate of the forbidden fruit, they would become as gods. Genesis chapter 3 verse 4. Thus, we have the roots of a very different kind of creation story, one in which human beings are striving for godhood against the wishes of a jealous creator. This situation implies a great deal of alienation from the world, from matter, from what we may call consensus reality. The reality upon which we all agree is the only true reality. 
The God of the Gnostics is alien to that of the universe, which it neither created nor governs, and to which it is the complete antithesis. Human beings, according to this view, were created by lesser creatures who themselves have no direct knowledge of the true God, and who indeed are obstacles to divine revelation. This Gnostic concept should resonate with those who believe in the contemporary theories of humans as a hybrid race, designed only for labor in the service of alien beings. And they may be surprised to learn that this concept gained a considerable number of followers, almost 2,000 years, before our current crop of ancient alien theorists. Confusion may arise in that both the creators and the true God are aliens in this view. And there is indeed a spiritual dualism implied that is anathema to Orthodox Jewish, Christian, and Muslim believers. However, to those who theorize that there may be multiple categories of beings who interfere with or who influence humanity at various times, this purely Gnostic concept may prove interesting, if not valuable. Gnostic theory was quite detailed and insistent on this concept and claimed that the entire universe was a prison, with the Earth its deepest, darkest dungeon. Around the Earth, in an array of concentric spheres, were the realms of the planets and the stars. In some cases, these spheres were limited to seven. In others, they extended outward from the Earth, for a total of 365 spheres. Certainly a symbolic number, and reminiscent not only of the number of days in a solar year, but also the number of years the prophet Enoch lived on the earth before he was taken bodily into heaven. While this arrangement seems like pure platonic theory, it also has elements in common with the earliest recorded civilization in the world, that of ancient Sumer. Perhaps the foremost proponent of an ancient astronaut theory involving Sumer is the late Zechariah Sitchin, 1920-2010. A former London journalist, a native of Azerbaijan who relocated to New York, Sitchin taught himself Sumerian in an effort to decipher the ancient cuneiform texts of that civilization. His work has been criticized by scholars of Sumerian, Akkadian, and the civilizations that centered in and around Babylon. Sitchin's translations of key texts, as well as his decipherment of some cylinder seals, was idiosyncratic, to say the least. But that did not stop his works from becoming worldwide bestsellers, translated into 45 languages. Less a scholar than an intuitive, one of those writer mediums of which Professor Jeffrey Kripal writes, Sitchin nevertheless touched on some specific weaknesses and speculations of current astronomical theory, introducing the idea that at some point in the distant past, there was a planet or planets in our solar system that exploded. A theory put forth by the late astronomer Dr. Thomas Van Flanderen to account for both the asteroid strike that killed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago as well as the existence of a civilization on Mars. Sitchin's main theory, however, that human beings are a hybrid race created as slaves for extraterrestrial rulers, has no actual basis in the Sumerian texts themselves. Nor is the existence of his 12th planet evidenced by the Sumerian cylinder seals, even though he has insisted that such evidence exists. Yet, something about this story, spread over more than a dozen books, touched a nerve in the general population. It seemed to explain something, to fill in a blank in the human record that has not yet been filled by evolution, or astrophysics, or genetics. As wild as Sitchin's theory may be, there is an element of something in the midst of all the mistranslated Sumerian, the mistaken Aramaic and the unsupported astronomy that resonates with those who understand that there is a continuing presence in the world 
that cannot be explained by science at its present level of understanding, and who do not feel they can wait for the scientists to catch up. So they gravitate to works like those of Zechariah Sitchin and Eric Von Daniken and others, and to the cable shows hosted by Giorgio Tsoukalos and David Hatcher Childress, because at some level, we know there is truth there, somewhere. There is a general distrust of authority in the world, whether it is of governments or of academia, of the military and the scientists. So conspiracy theory that used to focus on political assassinations has now expanded to include metaphysical speculations as well. The crossover from political conspiracy theory to ancient astronaut theories, holy grail romances, and ufology has created an underground that is part art and part literature, part science and part magic, part politics and part mysticism. Events in my life caused me to start questioning my goals and the correctness of everything I had learned. In matters of religion, medicine, biology, physics, and other fields, I came to discover that reality differed seriously from what I had been taught. Thomas Van Flander As Samuel Noah Kramer wrote, History begins at Sumer, and with the beginning of recorded history, we have the beginning of paranoia and the suspicion that all is not what it seems. While the truth may not be as Sitchin conceived it, there is still a strange and persistent element of terror in the cuneiform texts out of Sumer that may reflect concerns among these ancient peoples that are eerily similar to our own. One of the core texts of ancient Sumer is their creation epic, the Enuma Elish. Discovered in 1849 by the great archaeologist Austin Henry Layard, 1817 to 1894, at Nineveh, near Mosul in present-day Iraq. It is a text of about 1,000 lines in cuneiform and records the origin story of the Sumerians. While Sitchin and other ancient astronaut theorists spin complex tales of aliens and hybrids based on imperfect readings of various texts, the Enuma Elish is actually quite straightforward. According to this document, the cosmos, in its earliest form, before the earth and the sky were created, were composed of two gods, Abzu, the far water, and Tiamat, whose name means mother of life, but it also represents chaos, representing fresh water and salt water, respectively. Within Tiamat's body rest the other gods, including their leader Enki, in Akkadian, Ea, who will become an important deity to the Sumerians. According to the story, the gods make so much noise that Tiamat desires to kill them. There is a revolt, however, and Marduk becomes the leader of the noisy gods and manages to kill Tiamat, separating her body in two, with which he creates the world, one half for the earth, the other half for the sky. He then kills her general, son, and consort, Kingu, and from Kingu's blood and Marduk's own breath, creates the human race. There is no academic controversy over the authenticity of this text, and very little controversy over its translation. Scholars agree that this is the Sumerian creation epic, and as such, represents the earliest recorded creation story in human history. That should not be taken as evidence that it is somehow true in any kind of scientific sense in the way we understand science, but it is an indication of a deeply held idea about how the universe was created and ideas about the origin of the human race. This is a story in which human beings were created from the blood of one god an older god representing the establishment of Abzu and Tiamat, and the breath of another god 
representing an antagonist, the leader of a rebellion, and the great cosmic drama. In other words, human beings are seen as a hybrid race formed from two separate and warring divine beings. A hybrid that can be said to be a composite of matter and spirit, of blood and breath. When we look back on this now from the perspective of our modern context, we tend not to assign too much importance to this ethic. We have a tendency to treat narratives like this as fairy tales, superstitious nonsense, the blind grasping of primitive minds toward a reason for the existence of matter, spirit, and life, who fall upon a supernatural explanation that really explains nothing, but which serves as a means for subverting any further investigation as rebellious or even treasonous. If we use the system of cultural anthropology, however, we would be forced to acknowledge that the Enuma Elish represents something that, in the context of its time and place, was accepted as true in some way, and which reflected an understanding of human origins that was prevalent in Sumer more than 5,000 years ago. In more recent times, scholarships such as that represented by Hamlet's Mill and the heavily criticized works of L. A. Waddle, among others, offered a different approach to the problem. In the case of Hamlet's Mill, the theory was offered that much of what passes today for ancient mythology was actually an attempt to describe astronomical phenomena using the code words of gods, demons, serpent monsters, and the like. In the case of Waddle, there was an attempt to show linguistic similarities between widely divergent ethnic and cultural groups. The Sumerians, the Chinese, the Egyptians. In an effort to demonstrate a common racial origin, the more popular works of Sitchin and von Daniken build on these premises. And on the highly controversial claims by Robert Temple and others, that even the African tribe known as the Dogon were aware of astronomical phenomena about which they could not possibly have had any direct experience unless it had been brought to them by another civilization possessing either advanced telescopes or which had been traveling back and forth to the stars. In either case, this would not be a terrestrial civilization. No matter which source one consults, however, from the dusty cuneiform tablets of the Sumerians to the popular texts of the ancient astronaut theorists. One thing seems consistent. Religion as we know it has its origins, either in reality or in fantasy, and the stars. And there seems to be an agreement that humans have a divine, or at least astral, origin. The tantric texts of ancient India and the Egyptian narratives both describe the appearance of the cosmos as the result of a sexual act by the gods. The Bible specifically identifies the creation of Adam as an act of God who mixed mud with his own breath, a retelling of the Marduk story, to create a being in his own image and likeness. That breath has a divine origin itself is attested not only in the Bible and in the Kabbalistic works of the Jews, but also in the Indian Tantras and in the yogic practice of Pranayama, as well as in the books of European alchemists. This commonality of themes should be unexpected, if not impossible. After all, human beings roamed the earth and lived in different climates, different ecological environments, developed tools at different points in their evolution, spoke different languages, and were racially and ethnically distinct. From a postmodern perspective, it would be foolish to insist that there is any kind of common or Ur mythos that humans from entirely different backgrounds would share. Yet it is obvious that human beings from entirely different cultures, of different races and ethnicities, share some ideas in common, such as rituals surrounding birth and death and puberty, events that happen within all human societies 
and for which various myths are composed, recited, and enacted. These rituals provide a social function that contribute to the coherence of the community that celebrates them, as well as suggesting a larger context for the shared human experience. Keeping that in mind, we should remember that rituals and myths that pertain specifically to supernatural beings and their interactions with human beings are also fundamental to many societies around the world and have been since the beginning of recorded history, if not earlier. Creation myths usually refer to supernatural events and supernatural beings. It is rare to encounter an explanation for the existence of human beings that does not involve the actions of gods. As humans, we are obsessed with origin stories, as if knowing where we came from is relevant to who we are today and what we will become tomorrow. Origin Stories There is something deeply satisfying in knowing, for instance, the origin story of Superman or Batman or any of the superheroes that have populated Western culture in the last 80 or 90 years. That these are fictional characters is irrelevant to the allure they have, and we cannot stop making movies about these comic book personalities, or retelling their adventures in issue after issue. They represent, in a sense, a kind of popular religion. Supernatural beings who come to the rescue of humans, and who represent moral and ethical values. There is nothing new in this analysis. It has been done many times in the past. Yet, if we draw some similarities between these characters and the religions of ancient Sumer, Babylon, and Egypt as examples, we will find out that not much has changed since then except perhaps for one salient feature not found in the earlier epics, but essential to many of the new ones, the secret society. Superman came to Earth on a spaceship from an exploding star. Already we are in Zechariah Sitchin territory. While Superman's special abilities do not exist on his home planet, the Earth's environment interacts with his genetic heritage and gives him superpowers. Superman is an alien, a visitor, an extraterrestrial biological entity, or EBE. Since Superman was created in 1933 and did not become a DC comic until 1938, however, the connection between Superman and the UFO phenomenon was not a possibility at the time. Superman was instead a creature of the Second World War and the rise of Nazi Germany and its secret weapons. He was quite literally an Ubermensch in the Nietzschean mold, but one working for the Allies rather than the Axis powers. He was also an illegal alien. This illegal alien had godlike powers and characteristics. He fought existential threats in the form of supervillains like Lex Luthor. And he had a consort in the form of Lois Lane. He was a god who did not enslave human beings, but who came to save them, mostly from themselves. He thus had a great deal in common with ideas about divinity that we find everywhere from India to Indiana, but with a special attribute. No one really knew who he was. Clark Kent Catfish? Superman's identity was secret. In order to live among human beings, it was necessary for him to assume a false identity. He became Clark Kent, the mild-mannered newspaper reporter for the Daily Planet, yet another allusion to extraterrestrial themes. He walked among the citizens of Metropolis like anyone else, even more so. With his horn-rimmed glasses, fedora, business suit and retiring manner, he appeared more like a clerk in an insurance company than a divine being who could see through walls, fly through the air, speed around the world faster than light, and lift entire buildings with his bare hands. 
The association of enormous powers with a secret identity has a precedent in the history of religion, but it is a relatively late one. While there have been secret initiation rituals in many cultures, the rites of Eleusis and of Mithra come to mind. It was not until the Rosicrucian manifestos of the 17th century that the idea of a secret group of individuals with extraordinary powers became common currency. It was a secret society whose members also had a high moral and ethical character, as revealed in their manifestos. There was also an origin story concerning their founder, Christian Rosenkreutz, who had traveled to the mysterious East, most likely Yemen, where he obtained the knowledge necessary for the making of gold and the elixir vitae, a medicine that would cure any sickness. He returned to Europe and founded his mystical fraternity for the good of humanity. He eventually died and, according to the manifestos, was buried in a secret location, the Vault of the Adepts. At about that same time, we experienced the rise of Freemasonry, another secret society, whose members' special powers resided more in their sense of shared community and intellectual freedom than in changing lead into gold or administering the elixir of life. Their initiation rituals refer to an ancient ancestor or prototype. These, the Rosicrucians and Freemasons, were the Clark Kents of their age. It may be that the Enlightenment idea of a secret society, whose members have special knowledge about the workings of the world, became a lens through which later writers would understand the ancient texts of Sumer and Egypt. Did these civilizations possess secret knowledge about the origins of the world, and especially of human beings? knowledge that was suppressed by later cultures and institutions such as the Catholic Church, only to surface in the occult rituals and secret teachings of the Rosicrucians and Freemasons. If we had to believe Sitchin and von Daniken and the other ancient astronaut theorists, this indeed would seem to be the case. And the popularity of Superman and the rather darker figure of that other secret superhero, Batman, would be evidence that, on some level, some unconscious level, people understood this to be true. The Cult of the Reptilian In ancient Sumer, there were individuals who worked marvels in secret. We don't know quite what to call them, but they were feared by the general population. Terms like witch, or sorcerer would be used to describe these individuals. Persons who worked magic against the innocent. We do not know if these individuals were members of a society of like-minded ritual specialists, or if they worked as solitaries. But from the cuneiform texts, we understand that they were feared, not admired. The well-known Akkadian Maglu text, first millennium BCE, provides lengthy incantations and rituals designed to protect against this form of magic and its practitioners, who were known as sorcerers or witches. This type of personality would appear in the Bible in various places, as the Witch of Endor, who could raise the dead. 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 3-25 or in the famous admonition, so freely interpreted and abused, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Exodus chapter 22, verse 18. More to the point, however, is the reference to Let them curse it who curse the day, who are skillful to rouse Leviathan. Job chapter 3, verse 8. By the time Genesis was composed, Sumer already had been invaded, and the Sumerian people were fast disappearing. Although their language remained as a sacred tongue among the Babylonians, right up to the first century of the Christian era. Motifs from the Sumerian creation epic survived throughout the ancient Near East in the story of a massive serpent, 
a sea monster that was identified with the earliest moments of creation. In the previously mentioned passage from Job, the rousing of Leviathan is associated with curses and with those who work dark magic, the witches of the Maglut text. The female Leviathan had a mate in the male behemoth, according to Jewish tradition. While Leviathan was a sea dweller, Behemoth roamed the dry land. Reptilian monsters who represent chaos and who threaten human life are to be found in different cultures around the world. The human-reptile struggle is replicated from the war between Marduk and Tiamat to St. George and the Dragon. While the serpent was considered to be the natural enemy of human beings, there were those who worshipped them or who tried to control their powers for use against other human beings. There were even those, like the Gnostics, who considered the serpent in the Garden of Eden to be the real god, the alien god. According to Gnostic sources, it would be Adam who would make common cause with the alien god. If we are seeking some kind of moral equivalency in these narratives, we will not be satisfied. This is less a question of good versus evil than it is alien versus predator, with human beings occupying the middle ground between them. The serpent in the garden was an interloper, a stranger, who nonetheless knew that the demiurge who created the world was passing himself off as the one true god, when in reality he was a subservient figure who desired to keep humanity weak and in the throes of pure materialism. Ignorance is bliss, so the saying goes. And the Demiurge wanted to keep humans in a state of ignorance. The serpent wanted to awaken humans from their sleep, their lack of awareness, and their state of spiritual oblivion. Thus, according to the Gnostics, Adam did not fall from grace. That is, he did not fall asleep, but instead, awake. In one Gnostic narrative current among a sect known as the Mandians, the alien god, referred to as such, and also as the stranger or the messenger, came to the earth from space. He descended through the orbits of the planets to finally arrive on earth with the goal of redeeming humanity through knowledge. There was opposition to this from the gods of the planets wanted to thwart the alien god in his mission of liberation. Without delving too deeply into the story, the essential elements are plain. There are human beings on Earth, and they live in a state of unconsciousness. There are two alien forces on the planet, struggling with each other for supremacy. One force wishes to keep humanity asleep and unaware. The other force wishes to give humanity knowledge so that it may free itself of the clutches of the planetary forces, the Archons or Eons, and escape the prison that is the Earth. The alien god took the form of the serpent in the Garden of Eden and advised Eve that if she and Adam ate of the forbidden fruit that they would become as gods. Thus you had those for whom the serpent, including Leviathan, the sea monster of the Bible, represented pure evil, the devil, and Satan. These are the followers of the orthodox forms of the Abrahamic religions. Then there were those like the Gnostics, who saw this demonization of the serpent as the creation of what we would call today the mainstream media. The Gnostics claimed to know the real story, and in a sense, their version of Genesis could be called an early form of conspiracy theory. Reflexively, contemporary conspiracy theory, a phenomenon known worldwide today, could be considered a modern form of Gnosticism. If we include ufology, and many authors who had specialized in investigative journalism, political history and conspiracy theory moved to ufology, or even occult theories later in their careers, and vice versa, then we have the perfect environment for the development of something that transcends both ufology and conspiracy theory. 
A theory of reality that is as grounded in science and politics on the one hand and in mysticism and psychology on the other. A grand unified theory of consciousness which embraces the world of phenomena of every type. Phenomena of what we might call a non-rational or spiritual type as well as those of more fundamental material forms. Seeing the one as the extension of the other in a multiverse or parallel universe or in some version of hyperspace such as those mathematically represented by superstring or supergravity theories an environment that would require a specially trained consciousness to experience and within which to maneuver indeed one can interpret the demiurge as the patron saint of science it represents the material world and all that is in it the serpent represents a hidden force within the material world penetrating it making contact with human beings when the grasp of materiality is at its weakest this idea has been taken up time and again as serpents in many cultures represent spiritual power rejuvenation the shedding of the snake skin the coils of kundalini in indian tantra and yoga and the twin serpents on the caduceus of hermes and mercury among many other symbolic representations recent research into the genesis story and especially attempts by modern archaeologists to locate the physical site of the garden of eden has led to some interesting revelations new information has led some scholars to believe that there was a race in the near eastern region that predated the arrival of the sumerians this race employed words which were later adopted by the sumerians but which were not originally part of their language the names of adam and of eden itself are both borrowed so the theory goes from the language of an older race called by some proto-euphratian or ubadian just as sumerian would become the sacred language of the akkadians and the babylonians in this schema the word eden simply means fertile plain and the word adam did not refer to a person but to a settlement on the plain thus in a new interpretation of genesis the people of adam had to flee their fertile plain this was due to rising sea levels in the persian gulf which were obliterating the plain and submerging two of the four rivers that were said to be part of the garden of eden landsat images have discovered the missing two rivers below the waters of the gulf south of what is now iraq by the time the jews had incorporated this story into genesis presumably after the babylonian captivity from where this rendition is inherited many of the original ideas were truncated and the words in some cases lost their original meanings other sumerian texts such as those describing the great flood would make their way in abbreviated or altered form into genesis as well to some this would detract from the work of sitchin and others who see the sumerians possessing secret knowledge from the stars instead of survival stories from the seas however this need not be the case the more research that is done on the stories of the bible with confirming data from other near eastern documents as well as modern technological advances in ground penetrating radar satellite imaging etc the more one realizes that these are not fantasies of superstitious minds but reflect attempts to describe real events that occurred in real life to real people there will be those who will see in the latest research confirmation of their theories that the bible stories were based on older sumerian and proto-sumerian myths which themselves were little more than memories of a better life before climate change transformed the contours of the gulf region and forced hunter gatherers to join with the agriculturalists thereby losing their freedom in the process now forced to live in established settlements growing food and raising livestock 
The dwellers off the land became chained to a life that promised material wealth and safety in exchange for giving up a life of adventure and challenge. It was, in a way, a defiance of a god who had always provided before, and who now found himself being replaced by the farmer, the builder, the accountant, and the insurance salesman. That is only half of the story, however. Taken out of context, one can come away with the idea that the ancient peoples did not believe in spiritual forces at all, but simply used a kind of coding system to write down the important events of their history. The problem with this approach is that these same writings include detailed descriptions of other worlds, as well as otherworldly inhabitants. Eden, after all, was always on the Earth. It was heaven on Earth, a simulacrum of another place, a point on the globe where heaven, however briefly, made contact. Just as a presumably real place called Eden, the Fertile Plain, became an earthly paradise in Genesis, real events transpired to give the Sumerians, and later other Near Eastern peoples, such as the Akkadians and the Jews, a complex mythology of astral beings descending to the earth to impart wisdom or to wreak havoc. The emotional content of these stories constitute evidence that we are not dealing with normal disasters and the violent acts of ordinary humans, but with something else entirely. Genesis places the very human history of the pre-Sumerian Eden within a much larger context of spiritual forces and the spectacle of human confusion in the face of the seemingly irrational behavior of non-human antagonists. It would be a mistake to imply that religion or spirituality, or whatever term you wish to use at this point, did not exist in Eden or in early Sumer, because Genesis is nothing more than a history book. We need not look further than the Old Testament of the Christian Bible to come across numerous instances where confrontation with the divine means abject terror. The God of the Israelites is a vengeful, wrathful deity who destroys entire cities, empowers armies, demands bloody sacrifice. This is a power not of this world, a power from beyond. In the Western world, the relationship between humans and gods has been problematic from the beginning. This is especially true of the monotheistic religions whose deities are jealous, angry, punitive, and harsh. They do not share any human attributes, such as those enjoyed by the gods in polytheistic religions, except those that demand obedience and sacrifice. To the Abrahamic gods, humanity is a pathetic mess that needs straightening out, or else. From the perspective of an outside observer, this relationship seems to be based on some specific previous experience of both the gods and the human beings. At some point, there was a breach of trust, a betrayal, or some kind of disconnect between the two types of existence. The book of Genesis describes it as the result of humanity disobeying God's command not to eat of the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden. While largely understood as a metaphor, what is important to realize is that this story describes an act of will on the part of human beings that caused a rupture in the God-human relationship. This implies there was a time in Elo Tempore when human beings lived in a blissful state, free of worry, work, and death. This seems to be taken for granted by most of the world's religions, who almost uniformly characterize our contemporary worldly existence as the result of a fall from grace, a degeneration of the human condition. How strange, then, that science tells us that human beings are the result of evolution, not devolution. Evolution, of course, does not imply that human beings are getting better, only that they are changing in response to the demands of survival, 
and the stresses of an uncaring environment. In fact, we are told quite clearly that evolution favors only the continued survival of the species in general, not of individuals within that species. We as humans are only vehicles for the propagation of our genes. Our genes do not care about our individual identities, our histories, our first kiss, our last gasp. Their only concern is that we procreate. Nothing else is relevant. Consciousness itself, especially self-awareness, the experience of an individual identity, may be superfluous. After all, the instinct to procreate is just that, an instinct. It does not require much in the way of consciousness, just a functioning set of reproductive organs. Thus, the biblical and other stories of creation should be viewed from that perspective. Be fruitful and multiply. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 Was the command given to us by the God, not of the Jews, but of the genes? Procreating does nothing for the parents. It does everything for the genes. We are genetically disposed to having children, caring for them, and then dying off once we have done our job. Then what is the point of religion? What is the point of a perspective of reality based on individual salvation as opposed to the collective, if our only reason for existing is the survival of the entire species? Are religious laws designed for the same reason, to enforce a system of morality, an ethical code that favors the group over the individual? The Ten Commandments seem to reflect this point of view beginning with laws that uphold the authority of God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And then proceeding to a series of regulations that have as their sole concern the survival of the group. From thou shalt not kill to thou shalt not steal, etc. The moral code is a social code. There was no context for individual survival or indeed for the spiritual awakening and flowering of individual consciousness. That possibility seems to have been lost with the banishment of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, and the separation of human beings from the Divine, or at least from the Creator. There seems to be a disconnect between our physical natures, represented in this example by our genetic code, and our consciousness. Consciousness wants to be immortal, to live forever, to maintain its individual identity streams far into the future, far longer than current lifespans would allow. Hence the stories about going to heaven after death, about individual sins and the punishments for them, about the last days and rising from our individual graves and living as individuals with God. The genes want survival of the individual for a finite amount of time, to procreate and nurture, and then it is disposed of. Consciousness wants the survival, as long as possible, even after death, of something intangible and difficult to define, our identity. Is there a middle way? The near-death experience may hold a clue. You have all heard the stories of those who have died on the operating table and then come back to life after a few minutes. You have heard of the descriptions these survivors have given of a tunnel and of a light at the end of the tunnel, of seeing loved ones and of feeling a tremendous sense of peace. Sometimes these survivors return with the feeling that death is not scary or the end of consciousness, but something beautiful and even desirable. Modern medicine has explained this, tentatively there is no conclusive evidence, as a natural response of the body's chemical mechanisms, the sudden flow of endorphins designed to facilitate death by making it seem all warm and cozy. The problem with this explanation is that there is no discernible evolutionary reason for such a mechanism. 
What does the body care how consciousness behaves or what it experiences at the moment of death? The genes have spoken. The body is no longer important. Its job is done. What purpose is there in making the death experience pleasurable? Obviously, from the point of view of the genes alone, there is none. Unless, of course, death is only the end of Act One, in a play in which the principal player is not the genetic code, or even matter as we understand it today, but consciousness. The alternative explanation is a little more terrifying. That this slide into death, made easy by a flood of neurotransmitters, is designed by the genes to ensure that we do not seek physical immortality, since we are assured of something better after death. After all, individual immortality offers no benefit to the genes, and in fact, may be detrimental to the survival of the entire species as a burgeoning, deathless population consumes all natural resources to the immediate detriment of the younger generations and the ultimate destruction of the species as a whole. Thus, this pleasant near-death experience, or NDE, may have an evolutionary purpose after all. Go back and tell the others that death is not the end, that it is sweet, and that you will be reunited with your loved ones, etc., etc. In this case, the endorphins that flood the nervous system at the time of death are truly the opiate of the people. In the 1980s, a number of studies were done comparing NDE with that of the UFO experiencer. Surprisingly, many similarities were discovered in the way survivors of both types of experience understood life, death, the paranormal, etc. This may seem strange at first glance, but a search through the history of how think tanks and other government contractors approached the problem of the UFO phenomenon reveals that they understood, almost from the outset, that this was a problem essentially related to consciousness. What may not be well known is the fact that famed UFO researcher Jacques Vallée was himself one of the earliest members of the Stanford Research Institute SRI program, studying remote viewing, RV, working with Hal Puthoff and Russell Targ, and alongside Ingo Swan. He joined the program before the U.S. Army became interested, and the whole project was classified, at which point Vallée was no longer directly involved. In his own words, he says he was not a great remote viewer. Some people had the ability more than others, but that he learned how to do it from Swan and was capable of a rudimentary prowess. We should remember for what it's worth, and the worth may be considerable, that Ingo Swan was a Scientologist. Scientology is considered by historians of religion to be a UFO religion and that Jacques Vallée was once inspired by the philosophy of the Rosicrucians, as was his colleague, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, of Project Blue Book fame. It should be understood that Vallée is one of the foremost proponents of the theory that the UFO phenomenon is an artifact of consciousness itself, a conclusion that he arrived at after decades of research. While he does not discount the tangible physical evidence of UFOs, he understands that there is much more to the phenomenon than aliens flying around in spaceships. The psychological effects on observers and experiencers is so profound, so life-altering, that this seems to be the whole point of the experience, rather than merely a side effect. And doesn't this parallel the experiences of those who claim to have had visions of a divine being? Anomalous Mental Phenomena At some point in the decades-long investigation of the paranormal conducted by the U.S. Army, the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Navy, the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, 
and the Defense Intelligence Agency using such contractors as SRI and SAIC, among others. The tendency was to find terminology that would satisfy the type of language used in official reports. What the creators of these reports wanted to do was eliminate, as much as possible, what they called the giggle factor. Terms like ESP, psychic powers, telekinesis, etc., were too prone to abuse and ridicule. Thus, among many other candidates, one of the best characterizations of the whole field became AMP, or Anomalous Mental Phenomena. This would cover virtually the entire range of so-called paranormal abilities, everything from precognition and mental telepathy to psychokinesis or telekinesis, the ability to move objects at a distance using only one's mind. This latter ability was sometimes referred to as remote perturbation, as distinguished from remote viewing, and was believed to have numerous military applications. Remote viewing was an intelligence gathering tool, but remote perturbation would be used for sabotage, such as throwing switches on enemy equipment, causing it to malfunction, or disabling navigation and control equipment on aircraft, missile systems, submarines, etc. Both were AMP in that only the operator's own mind, consciousness itself, would be employed against the enemy forces. The science behind these methods was uncertain. Not enough study had been done before the government decided to see their applicability in real-world situations. It is quite possible that the White Coat Laboratory approach was counterproductive in ways we do not yet understand. While many of these AMP and RV operations were curtailed or shut down entirely, after decades of investigation and targeted missions, there is the persistent rumor that elements of the psychic warriors either remained on active service or called back into service, especially after the September 11, 2001 attacks. What does all of this have to do with religion, with consciousness, and with the phenomenon? As we said at the beginning of this project, our goal is nothing less than a revolution in the hard sciences, as well as the social sciences. A re-evaluation of what we know about our function, our purpose in the cosmos, and the potential opportunities and possible threats that exist. Many insist that we are the only life forms in the universe, certainly the only ones in our solar system for which we have any evidence at all. It is this very characteristic called life that is at the center of the controversy over alien influence and the appearance of unexplained aerial phenomena, UAP. It is also at the heart of the world's religions, monotheist and polytheist. And in order to start discussing what the UFO or UAP phenomena represent, we have to begin with defining our terms and locating ourselves in the universe. Until we do, we are taking way too much for granted. The First Religion It is generally agreed among anthropologists and historians of religion that the earliest form of what we term religion was shamanism. It is a field that largely has been ignored by ancient alien or ancient astronaut theorists who tend to associate alien intervention with the relatively advanced cultures of Sumer and Egypt. Most of what passes for ancient alien theory on the cable channel television shows is concerned with architectural and archaeological evidence, the pyramids, the Nazca lines, etc., onto which are projected ideas of alien intervention or influence. However, even examples of Neolithic archaeological sites around the world tend to support the idea that there is a cosmological and paranormal aspect to the ancient practice of shamanism that can be interpreted in a manner suggestive of an awareness of extraterrestrial origins. It is, in fact, with the Neolithic period 
that we notice it trend away from the type of art found in prehistoric sites that focused primarily on simple geometric figures, straight lines, chevrons, hash patterns, to more elaborate depictions of humans and humanoid type figures, as well as the almost surreal depictions of animals and other creatures. It is also the period when the great megalithic structures began to be erected. Structures that have astronomical, scientific, as well as ritual, mystical functions, such as Stonehenge. If one wanted to determine at what point there was some awareness of off-planet existence, it could be argued that the Neolithic period presents a clear demarcation between the way in which Homo sapiens sapiens understood the world as confined to the Earth and the way in which astronomy in the heavens became more important. It is also the period in which human beings became aware of the unseen aspect of nature. For there is no clear evolutionary purpose to the rituals of the Neolithic shamans, unless there was a belief that invisible forces could be approached and manipulated using human activity, work, that did not have an obvious direct relation to a given result. In other words, a hunter has a clear objective. His work is directly related to the killing of an animal and the providing of its protein to his tribe or clan. A shaman's work has no such obvious cause and effect characteristics. The function of the shaman, the priest, the sorcerer, the magician, the astrologer, the diviner, is concerned with the unseen. In other words, it is not rational or logical in any normal sense of those words, since it is action without discernible result. It is work, the expenditure of energy that seems to have no immediate tangible purpose. Yet to these hunter-gatherers, it was an occupation that was respected. At some point, it became understood that the shaman performed a valuable service. At some point, it was understood that reality was composed of more than what could be seen, or heard, or felt. That there were other influences in the world, and that certain individuals possessed the capability of understanding and manipulating those influences. At some point then, something that ordinarily was unseen became seen. However, if we posit alien intervention, or alien influence, we do not need to restrict ourselves to one period or one culture. Contact could have been taking place at various intervals in human history, and indeed, many insist, and the evidence suggests, that this contact remains ongoing. If there was contact during the earliest Egyptian dynasties, or during the Sumerian civilization in Mesopotamia, what form did it take? Ancient alien theorists use the religious rituals, iconography, and beliefs of these cultures as their starting point. And there is a reason for that. As we saw in the quotation from ufologist Am Michel previously, religious ideas and alien theories are often related. In the present day, there has been an explosive growth of what have been called UFO religions. The phenomenon lends itself to these ideas, as it consists of characteristics that are so foreign to everyday experience, as to place it in the same category as PSI, NDE, and other paranormal subjects. It is a working hypothesis of this project that what we call mysticism is a necessary adjunct to science when approaching the phenomenon, as Michel suggested previously. This shotgun wedding of science and mysticism will not leave either field of study unchanged, however, and we must understand this at the outset. In the first place, the term contact is itself problematic. If we are discussing the many ways in which the phenomenon manifests itself, Actual contact, with the implication of interactions between two species, 
is mostly what Michel calls non-contact. The phenomenon rarely occurs in such a way as to maximize visibility by huge numbers of human beings. There are no landings in major metropolitan areas. In full view of civilians, first responders, and news media. When sightings do take place in cities, they are almost always in the form of unexplained aerial phenomena, UAP, such as in the case of the Washington, D.C. overflights in July 1952, and not in the form of landings, and never in the form of humanoid figures exiting the craft and interacting with humans. Those are Hollywood images. Actual contact between human beings and those associated with UAP have been limited to individual cases, taking place in largely remote areas. In other words, in precisely the same environmental context and under the same circumstances as the initiation of the shaman, as we will find out later. What does this imply for the origin of the human experience we call religion, but which in this case can just as easily be categorized as mysticism or even shamanism? Did contact take place between human beings and some other life form in dim prehistory? Or was the experience or experiences more in line with UAP? And is there any substantive difference between the two from the point of view of consciousness? In other words, did the ancient peoples perceive a humanoid presence associated with aerial phenomena in a way that is close to us moderns? As this phenomenon partakes of effects that are psychological, we might say parapsychological, in terms that are better described using the vocabulary of religion and mysticism, we are confronted with the possibility that persons within different cultural contexts will perceive it differently and may see the phenomenon manifesting in different ways, or at least interpret it according to a vocabulary available to them, which, ironically, would be misinterpreted by later commentators in light of their own understanding of the terms. From what we know of shamanism, and particularly those forms for which we have more recent information from anthropologists and travelers in the 19th and 20th centuries. Contact with spiritual forces is an integral part of the practice, as is the experience of flight. This flight may take place to celestial regions, but can just as easily take place to underworld regions, meaning below the Earth. The studies seem to indicate that shamanic flight is dangerous under any circumstances, similar to an acid trip, which can be good or bad, depending on set and setting, and the psychological components of the tripper. A shamanic flight seems to be vulnerable to similar forces. The initiatory experience of the shaman may include such harrowing events as dismemberment and death, experiences that seem real enough at the time, but which can be interpreted as analogous to the kind of initiations that took place during the ancient Eleusinian mysteries, as well as those depicted in the alchemical illustrations of Renaissance Europe, and during Masonic rituals as well. While initiation implies beginning, such initiations may take place over a long period, and are thereby reinforced each time, albeit in a slightly different context. Freemasonry, as a modern example, provides a first-degree initiation, which involves the initiate being blindfolded and initiated at the point of a sword. A third-degree initiation includes a mock burial and resurrection. There is a progression of initiations, that implies a progression of intellectual understanding parallel to the emotional significance of the dramas that are enacted. The dramaturgy is essential to the initiation. The psycho-emotional content of the drama being enacted is necessary to create a psychological space for the symbolic content of the initiation to be understood, not only in an intellectual fashion, 
for which there would be no need of a ritual, but also in a way that cuts through conscious awareness of the external circumstances of the ritual, to a subconscious realm where the effects of the initiation presumably are felt. The ritual is a carrier of data, a large percentage of which cannot be apprehended intellectually, as it involves psychological components that will be experienced differently by different initiates. Compare this to the accounts given by UFO experiencers, and the similarities are obvious. There is very little purely intellectual content in the encounters, which almost always contain dramatic scenes and emotional trauma. The temple space used for the Masonic type rituals is what anthropologist Victor Turner calls a liminal space. It is a place set apart from normal waking consciousness, and its very strangeness is its most powerful aspect. The dimensions of space and time are deliberately manipulated to create an otherworldly sense, an emotional reaction to the somber surroundings with incomprehensible symbols and elaborate speeches full of hyperbolic statements and dire warnings. In order to accentuate these feelings, the initiate is bound and blindfolded. This creates an element of sensory deprivation and an awareness of one's own physicality, as well as the vulnerability of the body to forces outside of one's control. Refer to the works of Michel Foucault on the politics of the body. From the relatively sedate Masonic rituals, we proceed farther afield to the initiations of the shaman. Mircea Eliade has marshaled numerous examples from the available literature on shamanic initiation. In his influential shamanism, archaic techniques of ecstasy, while Eliade's analysis has been criticized on various grounds, the references he consulted largely have escaped appropriate. In these sources, we learn that shamans were individuals who were sometimes selected by other shamans or who were born into shamanic families. In other cases, the selection process was quite different. Either a potential shaman self-selected, deciding that he or she, there have always been shamans of both genders, depending on the culture, as some Paleolithic graves reveal, wanted to claim that career for whatever personal reason or the shamans found themselves selected due to other factors, such as psychological or physical disabilities, which indicated that the potential shaman was already halfway through the door to the other world. When one understands how a shaman functions in society, it becomes clear why illness should be a positive factor in selection. Illness is the poor man's altered state of consciousness. If it is a physical illness, it demonstrates to the sufferer that the body is unreliable and subject to changes, thus placing the sufferer in a different social category and conditioning him or her to think differently about the world and to suspect that there is a hidden or occult aspect to reality. Anyone who has been a patient at a hospital, for instance, realizes that they are in a world that is separate and apart from normal everyday reality. Schedules are different. Food is different. There is a different cast of players to deal with, all imbued with the realization that death is a distinct possibility. It is a world we never consider as part of our lives. Even as visitors to a patient in a hospital, we cannot appreciate the separation and isolation from the everyday world with all of its pleasures, pains and conceits that takes place once you're in a hospital bed and no longer have control over your own life, but instead have been rendered helpless with all of your bodily functions a subject of scrutiny by strangers. If it is a psychological disorder, then of course we are on track to understanding that reality is not what it seems, and that other modes of living and being in the world are possible, if unappreciated by the world at large. The psychiatrist R.D. Lang became famous 
some would say notorious, in the 1960s, for suggesting that a nervous breakdown was also a nervous breakthrough. His characterization of schizophrenia as tantamount to spiritual initiation went through a vogue briefly before it was superseded by a psychiatry that was more interested in chemically controlling the mind of the schizophrenic than in trying to communicate with the patients through analyzing their symbolic language. It was thought that the chemical approach was as close as anyone was going to come to a cure of mental disorders, and that since behavior could be changed using drugs, it was decided that certain mental disorders were nothing more than chemical imbalances in the body, a case of making the nail fit the hammer. This was Lang's politics of experience, the effort by medical institutions to come up with a socially acceptable means of identifying, characterizing, and treating psychic states as disorders rather than as spiritual quests, which has led some observers to consider the shaman as a psychopath. A shaman is expected to travel to the spirit world on a regular basis. A shaman communes with spiritual forces and is, in some cultures, possessed or inhabited by a spirit was revealed when the shaman is in a trance. In some cultures, this trance is auto-hypnotic in nature. The beating of the shaman's drum, or the sound of the rattle, may be enough to send the shaman into a hypnagogic state. In other cultures, and theogens, hallucinogenic drugs in the form of plants or fungi are used to bring the shaman into contact with the other world. This other world is a field of symbols, not only the static symbols of icons and images, but active symbols that manifest through sound, dance, the play of environmental forces, and the hereditary narrative of the village itself. The shaman is the living repository of the history of the clan or tribe. As such, he or she can communicate in a kind of sacred language, a shorthand of symbols and semiotic content that is comprehensible to the other members of the tribe and can be interpreted by them while the shaman is still in a trance. We find this in the contemporary example of the state oracle of Tibet. This is a tradition that has very little to do with Buddhism proper. It is a legacy of the indigenous religion of the area which is generally known as Bern. The origins of Bern are unknown, but tradition has it that it came to Tibet from a mysterious land far to the west known as Zhongjun. However, the position of the state oracle is an important one, and the Dalai Lama has been known to consult with the oracle in the context of a very elaborate ritual during which the oracle becomes possessed by a spirit and utters predictions in a coded language. It is safe to say that this represents an instance of shamanism. The person who is possessed by the oracle is the head of the Nechung Monastery in Tibet, now in exile with the Dalai Lama in Dharmasala, India. He is known as the Kutin, or material basis for the spirit oracle but only when in the context of the specific ritual that is used to summon it. In that ceremony, the monk is dressed in an elaborate costume that weighs in excess of 70 pounds. Under normal circumstances, the man hardly would be able to walk in it. However, during the ritual, the possessed monk becomes quite active, moving freely around the temple to the accompaniment of chants and music played on a variety of instruments. It is interesting to note that the monk does not perform as a shaman, except during the ritual used to invoke the oracle. Ordinarily, while he is certainly a spiritual leader, he does not act in the role of shaman, but only as the head of a monastic order. However, his function as oracle does take its toll and he has been known to require convalescence after each possession. In some cases, finding himself unable to walk for long periods of time. 
This gives us a laboratory case for understanding one aspect of the phenomenon. The permeability of the veil that separates this world, the world of everyday waking reality, from another world. We may call this other world a parallel universe. We may call it the ether, the astral plane, or whatever form is most congenial. Until we have developed our science to the point where we can know more about it, almost any designation will do. The problem is that many of these terms are so culturally loaded that they wind up carrying much more information and implication than they can handle. We would need to deconstruct or at least unpack these terms before we would be comfortable in using them. The term astral plane is quite suggestive and appropriate in some ways to this project, if we can extricate it from some of its more New Age associations. The word astral means, of course, starry. The astral plane is the plane of the stars. The concept is ancient and goes back at least as far as Plato, and then was expanded by Plotinus and the Neoplatonists. It goes back to the idea that the Earth was the center of the universe, and that around it were the orbits of the planets and the stars. One ascended to the heavens through the plane of the stars. Normally, one did not do this in the body. The body stayed on Earth, while the soul moved through the planes and then came back with information or insight. This is the journey of the shaman codified and made systematic by the ancient Greeks. While a human soul may travel outside the body to walk among the stars, the reverse was also true. Spiritual beings could appear on the earth if they were able to possess a material basis. The Tibetan oracle is one such material basis, a vehicle for the spirit to inhabit for a short period of time. Today, we might call this mediumship, or even channeling, in a kind of secularized version, minus the complicated rituals. All this goes to show that there has existed in human culture for millennia the concept that there are at least two worlds, this one and one other, and that they coexist. Travel between the two is possible, as is communication between the two. This is the privilege of persons who have a natural ability for this kind of commerce, or for those who have been trained in its processes. The medium, or the shaman, makes themselves available to spiritual forces who wish to penetrate into this world from their own. But what of spiritual forces who do not require the cooperation of human agency? What of those spiritual forces who just show up one of the hallmarks of the phenomenon is that there is rarely an effort by human beings to call them to visibility. The aerial phenomena just happen. They are unpredictable and unrepeatable, and thus they resist scientific testing which, by extension, means that they do not exist. It's a vicious cycle, a function of the scientific method which demands repeatability and predictability of scientific phenomena. There is, however, a precedent for this, although it has not been addressed before, since the entire subject resists any kind of sober academic study aside from sociological treatises on UFO religions and the like. The precedent is the European practice of ceremonial magic. A close relation of shamanism in some ways Ceremonial magic is predicated on the idea that a human agent can penetrate the spiritual realms while conscious and at a time and place decided in advance. Ceremonial magic uses many of the same basic principles as the ritual of the Tibetan state oracle described previously, with the major difference being the magician does not go into a trance or lose consciousness. The magician does not become a material basis for the spirit. Instead, the magician penetrates the veil that separates the proposed two worlds to summon a spiritual force to visible appearance. 
The way this is done is suggestive of some sort of familiarity with aerial phenomena. The typical arrangement, as attested in the Grimoire, the manuals of the magicians, is to draw two concentric circles on the ground. Between them is written a variety of magic words, usually in Latin, Greek, or Hebrew, as well as hieroglyphs that may be the signatures of various spirits, or the seals of spiritual forces that will protect the magician and ensure obedience from the spirits being summoned or conjured. The magician stands in the center of the circle, and there is usually a minimum of four candles or lamps, one at each of the cardinal points, as well as a censer of burning incense. Prior to the ritual proper, the magician is prepared with fasting, prayer, and other measures to focus the mind and create a state of sensory manipulation in which the only sensory input comes from the carefully constructed ritual. More than just a liminal space, the ritual area reflects the precise nature of the magician's goal, the colors of the candles, as well as of the furnishings of the room or environment where the circle is prepared, scents, the incense, sounds, the incantations, the ringing of a bell in a precise number, etc. They have been arranged to reflect the purpose of the ritual. The magician is dressed in robes appropriate to the ritual as well. One is familiar with the strange costumes of Merlin, or of Disney's Sorcerer's Apprentice. There may be an exotic headdress, symbols embroidered on the robe, a wand, a sword, an amulet or talisman, etc. In this way, the European magician shares some qualities with the Siberian or Tibetan shaman, for whom the costume is an essential part of the ritual. Further stressing the liminality of the ritual, but which may also be an allusion to the forms of another, more alien environment. The ritual begins with invocations to God, the angels, etc., and proceeds to conjurations of the spiritual forces. This may be accompanied by a specific series of knocks, or knells, strikes on a bell or gong the number of which corresponds in some way to the nature of the spirit being summoned, chanting of voces magicae, or what is known as abracadabra, seemingly meaningless syllables that have the effect of transcending normal language by robbing sounds of meaning or attaching arcane meanings, symbolic meanings, to sounds. Ritual gestures may include the sign of the cross or of the pentagram, etc. In other words, the entire field of action and sense is managed and tailored to the goal of the ritual. There is no wasted movement, no extraneous sounds or sights or smells. Thus, every event that takes place under these circumstances that has not been determined in advance, every random occurrence, is evidence of some form of contact. The proximate goal of this ritual is to force a spiritual entity into visible appearance. The magic circle serves to protect the magician from hostile spiritual forces and also reinforces the magician's position at the center, the axis mundi of creation. In the ritual, the spirit, angel, demon, planetary intelligence, etc., appears outside of the circle, sometimes within a specially designed and drawn triangle at some distance from the outer rim of the circle. This triangle may also contain lamps, burning incense, etc., and the spirit constrained to appear within it. The spirit then answers questions put to it, and eventually is given the license to depart. At that point, the ritual is over. If we apply the cargo cult metaphor to this ritual, a few things become apparent rather quickly. The concentric circles with the hieroglyphs and strange lettering between them can easily stand in for the aerial vehicle, 
a flying saucer, if you will, especially when we factor in the lights and the smoke from the incense, the odd sounds, and the oddly clad passenger within. Even the triangle is not unknown to UFO lore, as the contemporary sci-